Um, so I'm Zubin Garamani. I'm uh, in the Department of Engineering at the University of Cambridge. Uh, and I'm also currently uh, at uh, Google Research leading the brain team. Um, I'm mostly at Google, a little bit at Cambridge these days. Uh, but I've been in industry for a few years. Um, Google in the last two years, at Uber four years before that, and a couple of other things like the Alan Turing Institute and so on. And so the way I'm organizing, uh, I have two sessions today with a break in the middle. <clears throat> the way I'm organizing this is, I'm gonna give it a bit of an overview uh, talk um, in the first session of sort of uh, my you know, general personal research interests and research program. Uh, and how I think that uh, they fit into the bigger picture. And then we're gonna have a break. And then in the second part, I'm gonna dive into kind of what's going on in Google Brain. So I think that will be interesting for a lot of you um, as well. And it'll be very different from the first side. The first side is kind of more about like my research program and interests. Um, and that's really primarily around probabilistic machine learning and AI. Uh, and then the second side is going to be kind of a deeper dive into what is Google Brain, what does it do, what are some recent things that we've been doing at Google Brain. All right. And um, I wanted to say that I love coming to summer schools. I think summer schools are fantastic. I enjoyed um, a few summer schools when I was a graduate student and they left a very big lasting memory on me. And I hope you're all having fun, getting to uh, meet each other, and uh, learning a lot of good things. So, um, you know, enjoy it. Uh, enjoy it while you're here. Okay, great. So, probabilistic machine learning and AI. Um, I mean, the field of AI has been uh, really interesting and gone through lots of changes in, in uh, the decades. Of course, people have been interested in uh, machine intelligence for a very long time. So, you know, uh, most of the last century, people have had interesting things to say about machine intelligence. In the early days of AI, um, the researchers tended to focus on ideas such as logic and search and uh, symbols as the foundations of intelligence. This sort of relates to people's uh, thoughts about what made humans sort of special and intelligent is the ability to do symbol manipulation and things like that. Um, then in the early 80s, uh, mid to early 80s and early 90s, uh, there was a big resurgence of uh, ideas that related more to parallel computation in neural architecture. So people started thinking more about mapping things onto the brain. Uh, for me personally, that's when I was uh, starting to get interested as an undergraduate in uh, AI and machine learning. And so I sort of played around with neural networks in the mid 1980s. Uh, there was a huge wave of excitement around neural networks back then. Um, and uh, then as the field grew, uh, people actually got a bit disillusioned with neural networks because frankly, they didn't really work very well. Uh, and they were kind of a pain to train and uh, a lot of much more sophisticated mathematical ideas started entering the field, things like kernel methods and probabilistic models. Of course, as you all know, um, from 2010 or so on, there's been a huge resurgence of um, neural networks and deep learning again. Uh, and I'll talk a lot about that, especially in the second part of my talk when I talk about Google Brain and what we've been doing there. Um, and I also want us to sort of think about like what comes next, right? Because as researchers, we shouldn't be just looking at the present and the past. We should be trying to imagine uh, how to invent the future. Okay, so a few comments on terminology. I don't actually like the term artificial intelligence very much because I just don't think, you know, I, I don't think intelligence in a machine should be considered artificial. You know, if my calculator can multiply numbers, it's not artificially multiplying numbers, it's just multiplying numbers, right? Um, I kind of prefer the term uh, machine intelligence, uh, which is a bit more British, actually. Um, the Brits tended to prefer that early on, and but then, as often happens, the American terminology took over. Um, 
And, uh, you know, the distinction, if we're trying to understand the foundations of intelligence, the distinction between whether it is happening in squidgy neurons or in silicon or whatever, doesn't, to me, it doesn't make that much of a difference. Another concept that I wanted to get to is um, autonomy versus intelligence. So often uh, when people uh, think about their concerns about AI, what they're really concerned about is autonomous systems that are making decisions and taking actions uh, without any human control. Um, and I think that's a legitimate way of thinking about these concerns. Um, but you, know, you can have very dangerous things that are autonomous and not very intelligent. I mean, a good example of this is actually like if it, a, a landmine is an autonomous weapon and is not intelligent because anybody who stands on it, you know, might, uh, might get blown up. So this is a, a dangerous form of autonomy that has nothing to do with intelligence. So it's good to sort of separate out, like usually if you have a system that's more intelligent, it should actually be better at doing whatever it's supposed to be doing, right? Um, and uh, it's another term that, you know, personally I'm not, super fond of is general intelligence. Um, I know people throw that term around a lot. Um, first of all, just to say, like, don't knock specialist systems. Specialist systems are incredibly useful. If I build a system that does something really well, that's very useful for society, that's great. People tend to kind of think about general intelligence as a goal, but I'm not even sure how it's really defined. I think there are formal mathematical definitions of it that are slightly vacuous, actually. Um, I actually don't think that humans are generally intelligent. We're just primates that happen to have some skills that we're very good at, and we're actually really terrible at a whole bunch of things I would consider intelligence. Um, so I, I don't like to get caught on the term general intelligence. I also, frankly, don't like to get caught up on the term human-level AI um, for, the, uh, for the reason I just said before. Um, you know, it's not clear that humans should be a model for intelligent systems you know if you uh, I, I so my training was both in computer science and cognitive science and neuroscience and you know if you study cognitive science you learn very quickly about all of the flaws in human reasoning you learn about all the flaws in human perception um you know we're uh, we're uh not some sort of like ideal form of intelligence and i think that in um a lot of settings, what we really want for a reliable system at scale is something that uh, frankly works a lot better than a, a, you know, a human would, right? Because we want to be able to have uh, kind of better guarantees and safety on these systems than if you were just to scale up humans. Um, and really, I think the important thing, one more comment and then I'll say what I think is really important. Um, the other thing that I think people conflate when they talk about intelligence is the achievements of human society and civilization involving billions of people over you know, hundreds of thousands of years. They conflate that with the capabilities of a single human brain. So if you put me on a desert island or not even a desert island, an island with lots of fruits and vegetables and, and you know, uh, animals and so on, I probably wouldn't survive for a week. I'm not actually that intelligent outside of, you know, my uh, social context. I would not be able to sit there with my brain and, you know, carve out an iPhone out of wood or something like that, right? It just doesn't work that way. So don't confuse civilizational, organizational intelligence with uh, the achievements of human intelligence. And so finally, the, the thing that I think is really, really important here is um, when we're working in the field of AI and machine learning to really think about ways in which we can build systems that complement us as humans, that can do useful things uh, that help us in general. Okay, so it's a really exciting time for AI and machine learning. Um, you all know that. It's been really exciting because there have been a lot of breakthroughs in, for example, AI and games. Um, you know, in, a few years ago, this was big news, but now is sort of, uh, we're all used to it. Um, but it's been in particular really exciting because uh, there are actually a tremendous number of applications of AI and machine learning in uh, people's daily lives and the list kind of increases and increases. 
there are a lot of applications to uh, language technologies, things like speech recognition, question answering, summarization, language translation, dialogue systems, and things like that. Um, there are applications to uh, the world of images, image captioning, image editing. Um, there are applications to uh, autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars. Um, there are things that are you know, really interesting from a creative point of view, like for example, text to image generation. And I'll talk about that in the second part of the talk. If you, in case you're wondering, that is uh, an image, a cute uh, corgi sitting in a house of sushi generated by um, uh, Imagine, a, a sort of a, a neural network that can generate from text prompts uh, images uh, within a few seconds. Okay, so um, just a few more areas of application and I could fill many slides with this. So, you know, if, I don't bore you. I just have one more slide. Um, uh, I think AI has uh, pretty clearly changed the way we search for information, uh, changed the way we shop for things, um, changed the way we discover things through recommendation. Uh, it has had a huge impact and continues to have an impact on scientific data analysis in areas such as drug discovery. Uh, it has an impact on healthcare. I think the impact on healthcare is, is nowhere near achieved. We have a few small examples of that, but I'm very hopeful about the next decade having a lot more applications of that. Um, there are interesting applications in areas like weather prediction and climate. Um, again, we're very early days of that. Um, and robotics, I think most robotic systems that are used industrially are not machine learning based. But I can imagine over the next decade, we're going to get many more applications of machine learning in robotics as well. And of course, self-driving cars are basically robots on wheels. OK, so um, a lot of the excitement over the last um, decade has come from deep learning. And um, it's, uh, it's really interesting. So let me give you my perspective on deep learning. Um, so neural networks have been around for a long time. Um, and deep learning systems are basically based on neural networks. Of course, one can generalize in various ways. But what are neural networks? I mean, neural networks are just uh, tunable, nonlinear functions with many parameters. So at some level, they're incredibly boring. And that's actually why many of us in the uh, you know, uh, late 80s and early 90s, we were like, well, neural networks are super boring. Let's work on something interesting, right? Let's work on something that is maybe more technically deep, maybe um, you know more principled or something like that. So again, let's uh, think about that. So a neural network, uh, a supervised neural network, is mapping from some inputs uh, x to some outputs y. Uh, it has some parameters, uh, the weights you could call them theta, and um, it basically represents a function as a composition of functions through the layers of the neural network. Uh, so that's all kind of interesting. Um, now, how do we train neural networks? We tend to minimize some loss function. Most loss functions correspond to some form of log likelihood. There are certain loss functions that are not log likelihood. So, um, you know, you could say a neural network is just maximizing likelihood generally, although there, there's a lot of uh, kind of a cottage industry of people designing various different loss functions for various different things. And the way they're trained is through variant on stochastic gradient uh, descent optimization, which is a pretty uh, traditional optimization method. Um, and of course, you can have many variations on that. So a neural network is just a, a nonlinear function with a little bit of basic statistics, you know, the constant of a likelihood and some parametric function uh, and a little bit of basic optimization. So why are they sort of exciting? Why has this been uh, revolutionary? Well, um, so what's happened is a few things that have happened over the last um, decade or so. Uh, you take basically models that are similar to the ones that we were using in the 80s and 90s, but to get them to work um, better, a bunch of innovations had to happen. People had to figure out how to, for example, train a model that's quite deep that has many layers. So, you know, throw away the sigmoid function, use a ReLU, that tends to work much better. 
for the gradients to go through the model. Um, people came up with various ways of processing and tying parameters, for example, through attention. Um, but importantly, in the 80s, you know, we didn't have the World Wide Web, right? And so data sets were absolutely tiny. And the explosion in the size of data sets has made it possible to do a lot of very interesting things that wouldn't have been possible before. We also have had a vastly larger uh, compute available. Um, the neural network field has really layered itself upon the advances uh, in hardware architectures and cloud computing, things like GPUs, TPUs, et cetera. There's also much better software now. Uh, when I was a, you know, when I was an undergrad, I had to code up backprop myself. I had to derive everything. You know, I had to make sure I got my derivatives right, and I had to do it on a parallel computer in some weird esoteric language. You don't have to do any of that anymore. It's great. It's much easier. In fact, it's easy to the extent that uh, my daughter, about two years ago when she was 10 years old, um, did a summer camp where she trained a neural network. Um, this is, we were living in Palo Alto, so that's kind of normal there. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, I was like, wow, that's cool. She's like, nah, you know, I'd <laughs> rather play the electric guitar. Um, so um, we have much better software. It makes it much easier to do these things. Um, and then, of course, there's vastly larger industry investment. There's a lot of media hype, a lot of excitement. I mean, some of it is out of control. Um, so, yeah, it's different. Now, what I like to do is I like to think about, well, this is like working really well. Why is it working really well? Can I distill my challenges? Can I distill in one slide what I think are important ideas? There are thousands of papers out there. It's frustrating. I have no time to read all these papers. I only have the patience to come up with a slide with a few things that I think are important ideas. So let's distill what I think are important ideas. And occasionally new ideas come up. So the bullet list gets a little bit longer occasionally. So first of all, is the idea that very large models can work well. I mean, traditional statistics was very afraid of large models because of overfitting, uh, you know, in a very valid way. Although in the field of non-parametric statistics, people figured out very elegant ways of getting, you know, infinite dimensional models working. Uh, back in the 70s, right? So the idea of very large models has been around in statistics for a long time, a long time. But the machine learning people, those, those sort of um, computer scientists that don't care, they kind of were plowing ahead with ever larger models and not worrying about the statistical guarantees. So very large models can work well. And then, but when do they work well? When they, well, they work well when you use huge data sets, okay? So make sure your data set is very big as well. And if you don't have real data, simulate data. So create data out of, you know, maybe, for example, for gameplay, you, you have a simulator, you can create lots of data that way. That's how you can get a system to learn to play a game. Um, I think the use of automatic differentiation has been revolutionary. Um, uh, is, I was just talking to Jeff Hinton, happens to be at Google, and I've known him for, for since I was uh, a postdoc, actually much longer than that, since I was an undergrad. And I was talking to him and he was moaning about the fact that nowadays automatic differentiation makes it so easy for people to build ever more complicated things that it's hard to come up with, like, it's hard to encourage people to come up with creative new ideas. Because you can just build something crazy and just do automatic differentiation. But that's really liberating. It's just amazing that we have software to do that. Um, then to get models to be deep, you need to stay close to the identity. You know, you can have a hundred layers that are all the identity function and you still have the identity function. If you just tweak that a little bit, then you can get a system that, that can, can really do complex processing over many, many stages without the gradients going crazy. Um, the idea that stochastic optimization works surprisingly well is, uh, is I think really important and we need to understand it. Um, uh, better initialization uh, matters. Uh, I think people uh, have like rules of thumb for initializing these neural networks. 
Uh, if you depart from that, things can go bad, but then if you have good adaptive learning rates, maybe you can recover from that. It's all kind of a bit of a complicated system. Um, a really fundamental idea that's been around in you know, machine learning and statistics for, I don't know, a century is parameter tying, but the concept of symmetries. And a lot of concepts in uh, modern machine learning, a lot of architectural concepts have to do with choices that are made about which parameters you, you uh, tie to which other parameters. You know, things like convolution, recurrent networks, graph neural networks, et cetera, are all about tying parameters to each other. And then uh, a really important idea is if you think of a neural network just as a function that maps from X to Y, it's a little bit of a, you know, a weak representation of what's actually happening in the neural network. Because you don't just care about the X to Y relationship, you also often care about the internal representations in the neural network. So that, that high dimensional vector that then you can do all sorts of other interesting things with. So the concept of the idea that internal representations are reusable and parts of neural networks can be reused in various ways, uh, you know, for multitask learning or few shot learning, uh, you know, you can pre-train a model and train it to do something else. It's sort of hard to think of that if you just think of a neural network as a, a, a black box function from X to Y. Okay. Yep. Question. So um, you have a lot of these interesting parts, and I'm just wondering why you think like layer normalization, like any form of activation normalization, doesn't differentiate to each other. Um, so layer normalization, activi uh, activation normalization. I think it's it's important for getting things to work well. Um, I didn't kind of, it didn't make my list of top eight, but you know, you could come up with a list of top 16 of things like that. But there's some tricks that, you know, I feel some tricks are there because to compensate for other things that are being done stupidly. Okay. So basically if you do stupid thing A and then you come up with a trick B to make up for stupid thing A and then the thing works, then you know I don't feel like that deserves necessarily um, you know that uh, you know I think we if we had better optimization algorithms we wouldn't really need their normalization probably okay great so I mean uh, deep learning is wonderful I love it you're gonna see we use it all the time um, but it's also important as a community to uh, acknowledge all the limitations of deep learning. And so what are the limitations? Well, um, it's very data hungry. You often need you know, millions of examples to do something. Uh, it's very computationally intensive to train and deploy. Um, uh, deep learning methods are easily fooled by adversarial examples. There's a whole cottage industry of examples like that. Um, they're finicky to optimize. So, you know, it's back, back in the good old days, let's say, of support vector machines. Um, you know, the, the whole learning problem was phrased as a convex optimization problem. You knew you had a, a unique global optimum. You had well-defined mathematical algorithms for reaching that global optimum. You didn't have to worry about tuning learning rates and all this other hackery that needs to happen to get a neural network to train. Um, and so uh, the, that is actually you know, a, a valid concern. Um, uh, neural networks are generally uninterpretable black boxes, lacking in transparency and difficult to trust. That's really important when we come to applications of neural networks in real world scenarios where we need to figure out what they're doing, why they're doing various things and so on. It's non-trivial to incorporate prior knowledge and symbolic representations in a neural network. Um, again, you know, if you look at the history of AI, you know, we had uh, research programs involving like prologue and logic, and it was very easy to put in prior knowledge in the logical form into prologue. We have probabilistic graphical models and probabilistic programming languages, which I'll talk about where, again, it's very easy to explicitly represent the knowledge that you want. Whereas if, you, uh, if you're given a giant neural network and you're said, okay, now represent the, you know, the fact that, uh, I don't know, 
whatever. All, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to name any fact because I'll probably get it wrong. Um, uh, you know, represent this particular set of knowledge in a, in a neural network, it's very, very hard to do that. And, um, you know, generally neural networks are poor at representing uncertainty. And these are the kinds of questions that result in research programs. So if you, if you flip each of these things, you get a whole research program. So how do we make uh, deep learning better at representing uncertainty? How do we avoid being fooled by adversarial examples? How do we create tools for better transparency and interpretability, et cetera? Okay, so let's talk about going beyond deep learning. And um, if, uh, if any of you know kind of uh, the sorts of things that I've been interested, you may have even seen me use this slide over the last decade. So I tend to think of machine learning through the lens of probabilistic modeling. And in fact, I tend to think a lot about what is, the, what is a model outside of AI and machine learning? What is a model in, uh, in other fields of science, in science, in engineering? What do people mean by models? Because I think it's really, really, a really important concept. So a model describes data that one could observe from a system. That's one aspect of a model. It should be able to have some predictive ability about possible data. And we're gonna use the mathematics of probability theory to express all forms of uncertainty and noise associated with our model. And that leads us to also using probability theory to do inferences uh, from our model. So that's the concept of inverse probability or Bayes rule. It allows us to infer unknown quantities, to adapt our models to data, to make predictions, to learn from data. So it's a really nice overall framework for thinking about systems that reason and learn. Uh, I kind of think that there's, there's sort of, there, I'll, I'll talk about this later, but there, there are many things with intelligence, but one of them is reasoning and learning and the other one is decision-making. So we have, uh, Probabilistic modeling is a framework for reasoning and learning. And then we have decision theory as a framework for decision making. If you bring these two together, you almost have like a philosophical foundation of how to build an intelligent system. I'll talk about that later. Okay. And then everything else can be seen as approximations to that, basically. Um, so uh, here's how uh, we can express inference uh, at a high level. So this is Bayes' rule. The concept is um, before you observe the data, you have, uh, the system has some, um, some beliefs that are represented as a prior over hypotheses. Then for uh, any observable data, you should be able to compute the likelihood term, which is the probability of the data given any given hypothesis. You renormalize by summing over all uh, the, the space of hypotheses that you're considering, and you get the posterior over hypotheses given data. And that transformation of prior to posterior via data is called learning, okay? Uh, there are many ways of thinking about this. You can think of this in an information theoretic way. The data gives you information about your hypotheses, so you have a certain entropy over the hypotheses before observing the data. And then after you learn, you have certain reduced entropy over hypotheses. Um, and uh, you know, there are various other ways of thinking about this. Now, when I talk about data, what I mean is anything that's uh, measured or observed. And when I talk about hypotheses, I mean everything else, anything that is uncertain whether it's a model structure or model parameters or you know, hidden variables, it doesn't matter. Those are different terms that represent things that are not observed. Okay, so when we apply Bayes' rule to the concepts in machine learning, we get um, the following expressions. In fact, Bayes' rule itself comes from uh, two more fundamental rules, which are the sum rule and the product rule of, of, of probability theory. And it's a corollary of those. So learning involves um, 
starting from a prior over the parameters of your model. The parameters are theta here. You observe your data set. This black thing, uh, this black term is the likelihood. This red term in the bottom is the uh, marginal likelihood. This is a normalizer. And the green term here is the posterior distribution over parameters given data and models. This is a principled way of thinking about your uncertainty and parameters. Now, if you're, there is no optimization rule in Bayes rule. So you're not optimizing parameters. It doesn't make sense to optimize parameters for the good reason that you, know, you can overfit and it doesn't represent the uncertainty you have in your parameters. But you can think of optimization as an approximation to this process in various ways. So you know, people, people get to that approximation through various means. And then if you're trying to make any predictions about uh, unobserved quantities, uh, let's call it X, any kind of new unobserved quantity given the data, the way you're supposed to do that according to the sum rule and the product rule is you integrate or average the predictions for every possible parameter value weighted by the posterior distribution over parameters, that term in green that we just computed. Now, if you want to do model comparison between two different model structures, um, then you can use the marginal likelihood to uh, compare the probability of the data under different model classes. And it's very nice because the marginal likelihood actually compensates for the fact that some models have more parameters and some models have fewer parameters. Um, here's an example of using the marginal likelihood for um, model comparison in a very, very simple example of polynomials. So the red dots are data points and you can fit different polynomials like the, the constant, sorry, constant linear quadratic cubic up to seventh order polynomials. And of course, if you have eight data points, the seventh order polynomial will overfit massively. It will fit exactly through the data points. Um, uh, you know, at the zeroth order, maybe you're underfitting. I'm not sure. Uh, if you do Bayesian inference, the green curves show you samples from the posterior distribution of polynomials. It shows you some level of uncertainty that you might have. This bar chart here shows you that given this data, um, you uh, infer that, you know, quadratic makes sense, uh, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth, or seventh order are penalized because um, they have too many parameters. It's not warranted by the data. You get generally this shape of curves, although there's a lot of subtleties in there as well. But you get automatic Bayesian Occam's razor coming out of this, uh, this sort of framework. And the concept of model selection is one that occupied, um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of thinking in the machine learning world. Nowadays, we we tend to think about things in terms of auto ML and you know um, large scale cost validation. We kind of brute force our way through trying to do model selection. But the beauty of this framework is that we don't need to brute force our way. We can have a a nice framework where model selection questions like how many clusters are there in the data, what should be the intrinsic dimensionality of the data, is an input relevant to an output in terms of feature selection. All of these questions can be answered in a kind of elegant way by basically applying um, the marginal likelihood concepts that I've derived uh, in the previous couple of slides. And in fact, this has been done. The problem is um, your you know, the exact computations are expensive. So you end up making approximations, but it does generally work. So, you know, we have, I remember, you know, people used to be super excited about um, work on hidden Markov models that would automatically figure out the number of hidden states given a data set. And then if you give it more data points, uh, more sequences, the hidden Markov model would actually end up kind of invoking more and more states to capture the, the structure of the data. You wouldn't have to do massive cross-validation and things like that. You just run it once and it automatically figures out the model structure. And the field of neural networks is not there. We've kind of lost that now. Um, lots I could say about this. Okay. So um, the core concept behind um, the Bayesian Occam's razor idea 
is the concept of a marginal likelihood, also known as the model evidence. And this, this is the term in red here. It is the probability of the data under the model integrating over the parameters. Um, and the, the fact that you're integrating is very important. So you're not optimizing over the parameters, optimizing results in overfitting. If you're integrating over parameters, the dimensionality of the parameter space gets integrated out. And then you get an honest measure of whether a particular more complicated model is a better model of the data than a simpler model. There are various interpretations of marginal likelihood is the probability of the data under the model averaging over all possible parameter values. Uh, is the probability that randomly selected parameters from the prior would generate uh, a data set. So the prior matters and it necessarily should matter in this setting. Uh, there is an information theoretic way of thinking about this, which is it's the number of bits of surprise at observing data D under model M. So a better model is a model for which the data is less surprising, et cetera. Any questions about this? Okay, just to gauge the audience, how many people know everything I've said so far? Okay, all right, raise your hand bravely. Right, okay, good. Okay, so um, for those of you who already know everything I've said, congratulations. <laughs> um, and uh, There'll be more interesting things, don't worry. Okay, so um, why do probabilities matter for AI? I think that uh, we want calibrated model and prediction uncertainty. I think that's incredibly important, especially when we are applying these things in the real world. And I've seen that, especially now at Google, I'll have examples of that um, uh, where, you know, if you don't have a calibrated model, it, you know, it's not gonna be good. Um, as I just described, automatic um, um, model complexity control is really nice. This is basically an Occam's razor idea. Um, uncertainty is particularly important in decision making, right? So, you know, if you look at the whole RL literature, it's often really focused on uncertainty because you don't know what's going to happen. So you need to have a representation of uncertainty be able to decide what the right next action is. Um, and uh, this framework is also important for building in prior knowledge. And we want systems that can learn on both large and small data sets. I think if, you know, if we have a theory of machine learning that only works when you have million data points or more, it's pretty unsatisfactory. OK, so um, I'm going to give uh, just a few, uh, I'm going to touch on a few areas that you know, I've been involved in over the last um, decade or so, and, uh, and then we'll take a break, and then I'll talk about the stuff that's happening at Google Brain. So one area, I've talked about deep learning, I've talked about Bayesian inference. These are uh, complementary. So deep learning refers to structures of models, Bayesian inference refers to a framework for learning these models. So you can mix and match these concepts. And a lot of people in this room, including myself, have been really interested in uh, Bayesian approaches to deep learning. <coughs> and in fact, there's a really great history uh, to these ideas going back to the early 1990s, where um, you could take a neural network and instead of optimizing the parameters, you can say, well, um, Let's do Bayesian inference over the parameters. So you start with the prior over the parameters, those weights. And then you observe the data and you try to compute or approximate the posterior over the parameters. There are many different methods for making those approximations. But from a theoretical point of view, an interesting link uh, that Radford Neal made was to understand that a neural network with one hidden layer and infinitely many hidden units and independent priors on the weights that converges um, and when you take that infinite limit of, of the number of hidden units to a Gaussian process, uh, which is a distribution over functions. So that's super interesting. And a lot of us at the time took that and said, great, we can throw away neural networks. Let's work on Gaussian processes. And we still do that, right? Because I think it's really valuable and important, but maybe we don't want to throw away neural networks. 
Um, now, if you look at, so that's for a single layer of hidden units. What happens if you have a wide and deep neural network? Um, so multiple layers. Well, we have concepts like deep Gaussian processes, which are very interesting, but we can also look at um, the behavior of a wide and deep neural network. And the, here's a paper. And what I want to show you is really this picture, which is at the top is the uh, predictive um, uh, for the data in red, the, the mean and the error bars of the predictive distribution of a Gaussian process. And at the bottom, it's computed through lots of sampling for a Bayesian uh, deep network. And they basically look the same. And in fact, if you, if you look at the theory, if you make a deep neural network, it's sort of simple deep neural network, infinitely wide, not with the complicated parameter tying and stuff like that. So fully connected deep neural network, infinitely wide, and you make it deep, it still turns into a Gaussian process. And there are a number of papers along these lines. Um, Gaussian processes are a beautiful concept, uh, over 100 years old. Um, they're probability distributions over functions. Uh, they're infinite dimensional generalizations of Gaussian distributions, and we can use them anywhere we have unknown functions um, for regression, classification, ranking, dimensionality induction, etc. And they have these nice relationships to um, things like kernel machines, like support vector machines. Uh, they have nice relationships to logistic regression. Um, to You can start, I, I like these cube diagrams because basically it, I like to relate things to each other because I don't think anything is really new. I think everything is variations on old ideas. Uh, I'm always skeptical about papers that say they have new ideas because I'm like, yeah, sure. I'm sure there's an old idea there. Um, but, you know, we, that's how science gets built, right? People build on, people build on each other. They re rediscover and rename other people's ideas, sometimes maliciously, um, you know, but people build on each other's work. Um, and I think that's fine. So let's start with linear regression, the most important cornerstone of all of statistics. And then we can do various operations to it. We can turn it from a regression model to a classification model. These are the magenta arrows. We can take uh, maximum likelihood training and think about Bayesian inference. So those are the blue arrows. So that gets you to Bayesian linear regression. And you can do, instead of linear regression on the original feature space, you can map the input features to some higher dimensional feature space. That's called the kernel trick. Um, so you get kernel regression, and in here, kernel classification would be where support vector machines are, and GP classification is like uh, Bayesian support vector machines, roughly speaking. And of course, neural networks are just instead of that, you could have a you know a different dimension. One way of getting nonlinearity is you map your uh, inputs into some feature space through the kernel trick. Another way you get nonlinearity is you map your inputs through to some feature space using multiple layers of a neural network. So it's just a different way of getting nonlinearity into your functions. The nice thing is um, that we can uh, play with these neural network type, um, with these Gaussian process type models and mix and match them with neural networks with software tools that integrate well into PyTorch and TensorFlow. So GPFlow, GPyTorch, and variations on that are just ways of getting Gaussian processes to work nicely with neural networks so that we don't have to bother with different code bases. Okay, so uh, the concept of Bayesian deep learning has been around uh, for um, 30 years now, at least. Um, David Mackay, who used to be here, um, uh, was really a pioneer of this uh, er area. Um, and there's been a lot of work, so really don't, don't, don't anchor on these references. There are dot, dot, dot. These are many, many papers in this space. Um, and the key concept that I want to get across here is 
getting better uncertainty estimates out of our models. So when, when we're outside of the range that the models have been trained on, um, getting the models to tell you that they don't know what they're doing. I think that's really, really important. So that's this big you know, cloud of uncertainty outside of the training data that seems important to me. I'm gonna skip over this. Um, there are a few other ideas I've been interested in over the, in the last few years. Um, another idea that is kind of related to uh, deep learning, but comes at it slightly differently is uh, some product networks or probabilistic circuits. Um, there's some really interesting uh, possibilities there, um, taking some product networks and scaling them up in the same way as we do deep learning. So deep sum product network, well, what's a sum product network? Some, some product network is a compact representation of a potentially exponentially large mixture model. Mixture models are ways of representing probability distributions. They can be used in, like mixture of Gaussians can be used in a continuous space. You can use mixtures of uh, other discrete distributions for other kinds of data spaces. So it's not just about continuous distributions. And um, the concept of a deep sum product network is to make a large sum product network with a, you know, a somewhat random structure that can be trained using deep learning type methods. So that can be uh, trained using stochastic gradient descent and automatic differentiation. <laughs> and the reason why I think this could be interesting, and we've, we've done a bit of work on this, is that it plays nicely with uh, neural network uh, software and hardware. So you can do automatic differentiation and use GPUs and things like that for this. <coughs> These types of models can be used for both generative and discriminative learning. Um, you know, for on small examples, we can get sort of competitive results uh, with deep learning. Um, they have better calibrated uncertainties. Uh, it, you can compute the likelihoods exactly. So for example, in a VAE, it's very difficult to compute the likelihood. In a sum product network, you can actually, you have a, an efficient procedure for computing the likelihood. You can efficiently and exactly do marginalization and conditioning, which is useful for dealing with missing data and detecting outliers and things like that. So I think these models are underexploited. It's still a hypothesis, but you know, there could be more work done on these types of models. That's just the picture of some product network. I won't go into it. And these are just examples of, you know, some comparison from one of our papers. So I won't go into that. Um, a third area I want to highlight is probabilistic programming. This is something I've been very passionate about um, over the last uh, decade again. Um, and what probabilistic programming does is um, it allows you to really make probabilistic modeling hopefully a lot easier. And the concepts are really elegant and beautiful. So I want people at least to understand the key concepts. So it comes back to this um, model-based view of machine learning. So uh, when we think of writing models, um, we can think of various ways of writing models. So in machine learning, we tend to think of a model as a piece of code, right? But in other areas of science, like in biology and economics and physics, models are often like, you know, equations or even verbal descriptions of models. But usually when people write models in scientific papers, they're actually trying to express uh, potential predictions of their model, right? Now, um, in probabilistic programming, what we do is we take the concept of a model very seriously. We say a model is not going to be expressed as a set of equations or words. It's going to be expressed as a computer program that can generate possible data sets. And it could be a conditional program, a conditional model. You could give it X and it would generate possible Ys. A, an unconditional or generative model would just, you, you initialize it, it would generate different values of X, okay? Doesn't really matter. But it's a computer program that generates possible data sets. Well, there's a name for that. Um, that's also called a simulator. So if you have an economic simulator or a climate simulation or a simulation of like a biological circuit, you know, those are all simulators, right? 
So let's think of simulators as computer programs that uh, generate possible data sets. And often when you have a simulator of any kind, you have um, unknown quantities. You have um, parameters in that simulator that you might not know, constants, you have structure of the simulator that you might not know. And so you represent explicitly the idea that some of the parameters of your simulator may be, might be unknown. Now, when you have a simulator, you can do various things. You can do forward simulation. So you can simulate different scenarios. But the really interesting thing is when you have observed data, when you have real data, you can say, well, what should the parameters and initial states, et cetera, of my simulator, what should they have been to match that observed data? So that's like running a computer program, um, not in the forward direction, but in the backward direction. Given the output of the computer program, what should the inputs have been? If it's a deterministic computer program, maybe there's only one value of the inputs. But in any kind of realistic model, the right answer to that is a probability distribution over the possible hidden parameters and inputs of your computer program. So probabilistic programming is a way of uh, expressing your simulations through uh, programming language. And then in the back end, what you have is a universal inference engine that can basically run Bayes' rule on computer programs. It can infer hidden quantities from computer programs. It's very similar to automatic differentiation, which tries to compute derivatives through computer programs, but this is actually trying to do Bayes' rule through computer programs. And it's super interesting and the ideas have been around for actually a few decades now, you know, uh, three decades. If you look at um, things like bugs is, a, is an early probabilistic programming language. Um, I've been, uh, you know, personally involved in both Turing here in Cambridge, um, which is a uh, probabilistic programming language based on Julia. Um, which is a very nice and, and simple, elegant language for expressing uh, um, probabilistic models. And Pyro, which we developed when, um, when I was at Uber in Uber AI Labs, which is a probabilistic programming language based on PyTorch. Uh, TensorFlow probability is based on TensorFlow, also actually JAX. Um, so there's a number of probabilistic programming languages uh, based on different um, neural network frameworks. And then in the back end, what they're doing is automatic inference. So, you know, just like um, a high school student now doesn't need to compute derivatives by hand to train a neural network, uh, if you use a probabilistic programming language, you don't really need to know how Markov chain Monte Carlo works or is implemented to be able to do inferences over data. Okay. So here is just an expression for a hidden Markov model in a few lines of code of Turing. Um, and then you just give it data and you tell it to go do inference and it does it for you. So it's, it's super cool. We're trying to get things to work faster, of course, but you know, it's, it's very, very uh, exciting. I'm gonna skip over Bayesian optimization. So we have a little bit of time for a break. Um, I'm a big fan of Bayesian optimization. It's, it's amazing. You should all learn more about it. <clears throat> Not here, um, but there's plenty of YouTube videos on this. Um, right, and then I'm gonna spend about two minutes, um, you know, back to philosophizing and then uh, the next hour will be very concrete stuff that we're doing. So my philosophizing is gonna be around like, you know, there's a lot that's been said about like AI and you know, how do we build an AI system? Do we have the mathematical principles uh, required to build an AI, uh, a, a machine intelligence? And I think to be able to do this, we need principles for perception, for learning, for reasoning and decision-making. And you know, in my view, maybe we already have most of the principles we need, okay? So for perception, we've got pretty good systems that can, you know, 
detect objects, segment objects, do all sorts of interesting things with deep learning. We have concepts uh, and those deep learning, the principles go down multiple layers. So optimization is used there. Bayesian inference can be used to deal with uncertainty in your perceptual system. And we know that more data really helps, right? You know, these vision, language, et cetera, systems, uh, speech recognition, all of these things, like when you get more data, it just works better. What about learning? Well, what are the principles for learning? Again, I've tried to talk about that. Most people think about the principles for learning as, as equivalent as the principles for optimization because people tend to think about learning in terms of optimization. I tend to think of it in terms of Bayesian inference uh, with optimization being kind of a, a crude approximation to what you would want to do for Bayesian inference. Um, you know, we all like loss functions. We all like uh, likelihood principle and things like that. So we kind of have principles for learning as well. What about reasoning? Well, we want systems that can reason. And these are, you know, there, there is a lot of work on uh, formal reasoning systems, logic, right? You know, people used to build logical reasoning systems. Um, probability theory, it's a generalization of logic that can deal with uncertainty. And for decision making, we have principles for that as well. We have a whole field of like decision theory. You know, we can, the, this is not just machine learning people. It's like economists, psychologists, many, many communities, control theorists have, have thought about what are the principles for optimal decision making, right? We have concepts like Bellman's equation, we have game theory and so on. So I think, you know, maybe we kind of have all the ingredients and we are building various different kinds of intelligent systems, but we just need to do everything better and more efficiently. So better inference methods, better ways of approximating the exact forms of inference that you would want to do. And so those are all these sort of terms in, in red that are here. Okay, I'm gonna skip over this because I'll be talking a little bit about it later. There are a lot of societal opportunities and challenges for AI. There's great things, but also lots of things that we need to be concerned about. You know, aspects of uh, privacy, interpretability, who's controlling and building these systems? Are they fair? Uh, you know, we want to build these systems so they're tools for society to help human flourishing and that, you know, there, there are obviously many negative uses of this technology as well. And uh, that's it. Um, there is a sort of, for the publishing machine learning side, there's a review paper from 2015, which is a bit old now, but it captures a lot of the key ideas um, and it's been a very active area of research. So thanks, we should take a break. Um, and then